Good evening. Welcome for tonight's event and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Claire and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm pleased to introduce this virtual event with Julia Tertian presenting her new book, Simply Julia, 110 Easy Recipes for Healthy Comfort Food. She'll be in conversation with Claire Savitz. Uh, through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new and expanded virtual community uh, during these challenging times. Thank you for joining us tonight in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. Uh, we appreciate your support now and always. Uh, every week we're hosting events and our schedule appears on our website at harvard.com slash events. Uh, we can also sign up for our email newsletter and even browse our shelves from home. Uh, after the introduction, I'll drop a link in the chat to purchase a copy of Julia's new book. Um, your purchases and financial contributions, I'll also share a link to donate, make this virtual event series possible and now more than ever support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Uh, this evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. Um, if, you if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, you can just go to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. Um, and finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings low these many months, uh, technical issues might arise. Uh, if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly and we just thank you for your patience and understanding. Uh, Julia Tertian is a favorite of home cooks everywhere, having authored many cookbooks, including Now and Again, Feed the Resistance, and Small Victories. You may also be familiar with her podcast, Keep Calm and Cook On. In addition to all that, she's on the Smithsonian's Kitchen Cabinet Advisory Board for the National Museum of American History and founder of Equity at the Table, which is an inclusive digital directory of women and non-binary individuals in food. She'll be joined in conversation tonight by Claire Saffetz, author of last year's Wonderful Dessert Person. She's a recipe developer and video host, and you may be familiar with her from her time at Bon Appetit. Uh, from scallions to sourdough to slow cookers, if there's been one thing we've all been doing the past year, it is home cooking. Uh, with restaurants closed and lockdowns in place, many of us have spent more time in our kitchens than ever before. And we're maybe running out of ideas. Enter Julia Tertian and her wonderful new cookbook, Simply Julia, 110 Easy Recipes for Healthy Comfort Food. These recipes are practical, comforting, nutritious, and absolutely perfect for the home cook, whether or not you're in a quarantine. Uh, Publishers Weekly says this what works for you approach succeeds in reminding home cooks that delicious food doesn't have to be complicated. The spirited collection charms on every page. And for Vogue, Michelle Ruiz writes, I think it's all the well-deserved love, but I'm here to advocate for Julia Tertian's culinary startup. I am really pleased to turn things over to tonight's speakers. And so I will uh, get the videos on and say uh, the di digital podium is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Julia, can you see and hear me? <laughs> I can see and hear you. You can see and hear me. Great. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, thank you, Claire. I want to thank the Harvard Bookstore for having us. Um, we are here tonight to talk about Simply Julia. Uh, I'm very excited. And so I'll just say a few more words about the book and then we'll, and then we'll start our conversation. So Simply Julia reinterprets classic dishes and family recipes into wholesome, easy meals. The recipes are unfussy but bold, creative but accessible, like roasted cauliflower soup with turmeric croutons and roasted banana and sour cream waffles. The book also features personal essays, family photos, menu planning ideas, and lots of helpful lists, like seven things I learned from being a private chef that make home cooking easier. Simply Julia emanates an attitude of inclusiveness toward food and others and argues that cooking can be a means toward building community and connection with others. My name is Claire Saffitz and it's my pleasure to be able to chat with Julia tonight about our new cookbook um, and thank you to the Harvard Bookstore for hosting us. Um, hi, Julia, congratulations. Hi. <laughs> that was so kind. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm so happy to be here and I, again, also thank the Harvard Bookstore and just all the independent bookstores that support people like us. It's, um, I don't know, I've just been thinking so much lately about one of the, I think, benefits of being an author that we don't get to say out loud enough is just how many great people you meet that sell books, like people who are into books are really wonderful. So I just feel so lucky to be supported by them and very grateful to you, Clara, for being here and just, um, yeah, for what you just said, that was so kind and I'm super happy to talk to you about anything and everything. 
Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, I'm honored to be part of like one of your first stops on your book tour for Simply Julia. Um, and so one of the things I mentioned in the little intro was like all of the lists in the book. And I love that the book features, this is your handwriting, correct? This is Yeah, your, all over the book, yeah. Lettering, right? Yeah. Um, I'm sort of wondering, like the lists are very user-friendly and it makes sense in a cookbook because it's sort of easy to digest and to, to sort of take in the information. Um, but I'm wondering, like, are you a list maker? Is this how you like organize your life? Yeah, um, big time, yes. I basically just wanted the book to feel like my endless grocery list <laughs> of life. <laughs> um, I have, I mean, one thing I write about a bit in the book, happy to discuss if you want, is just, I, I, um, I don't know, I skew quite anxious <laughs> and writing lists of things just helps me feel just the way cooking does. It makes me feel like I've got a handle on things. I know what to expect. I have a sense of control, even if it's artificial. Um, and one just like funny story I would tell you just because you brought up list was when I was in high school, I took a week long catering course at the new school. I lived in Westchester County and came into the city to Manhattan to go to the new school to learn about catering with a lot of adults of which I wasn't. And on the first day, the instructor was like, if you are someone who loves to make lists and all the people in your life think you make way too many lists, like you're in the right room. And I was like, I have found my people. Like I'm here, I've arrived. So yes, I love lists. Thank you for bringing them up. <laughs> yeah, that you like found your calling. Um, well, I mean, I love the personal touches in the book. It, being able to see your writing, the family photos that you include, the personal essays, and you say in the book that this is your most personal book, and you've written many, many in the past. And so was that, like, what was that decision like to personalize this book and make this something that sort of, that talks a lot more about your personal life and your family history? And was that, was that scary? And, and why, why now? Why did you wait until now to sort of make that decision? Yeah, it's a great question. I, um, it's actually, it's, it's sweet for me to think about this right now because I was just, um, last night I was texting with my editor, Julie, who's really wonderful to work with. And she had encouraged me throughout this process to, you know, not be afraid to put myself kind of in it. And um, I just was texting with her, just saying how much I appreciated that because it now that the book is out, I'm feeling... I was feeling a lot of anticipation of what that might feel like, you know, anxious anticipation, but also really positive, like excited. And now I'm just feeling what it's like to see it. You know, you just held it up. Like it's, it's still, I'm like, oh my God, it's in your hands. Like it's in your home. Um, and it feels really good. And, you know, I have had the great fortune of putting so much of myself into my work and having it be warmly received. Like that is, you know, something I do not take for granted. It is like super vulnerable and, I just feel a lot of support and that feels pretty amazing. But yeah, in terms of the decision to do that, I feel like all of my work has always been pretty personal, but this book is just much more so. And it, you know, yes, it's in some of the design stuff that you mentioned, like my handwriting is, you know, everywhere, <laughs> every title, every recipe title, the title of the book, family photos, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, I'm on the cover of the book. That's not something I've done before. But really, I think where the real, like, um, so much of me comes through is I got to do more writing in this book than I've done before. And there are essays and my head notes, which I know you know, but if anyone listening doesn't know what that is, it's, you know, the introduction to the recipe. Um, they're long in this book. Like, I tell a lot of stories and I basically feel like I wanted to include these stories and include so much of myself in the book not from like a place of ego, but from a place of just honesty and just, I know what it's felt like for me to read really honest reflections by people, whether it's in a cookbook or a memoir or whatever type of book. I mean, I feel like in some ways, like, I'm like, did I write a memoir with recipes? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> um, but I do that because I think when we share honestly and when, we're, when we have the support and safety to be vulnerable, you know, we really can have connection. Like it can make really beautiful, amazing connection, which to me is the whole point of food. Like to cook food, you can feel deeply connected to the ingredients or the people you're cooking for to eat it. 
you can feel so connected to yourself if you're eating alone um, or to the people around you. And in my experience being a cookbook author, you know, you've mentioned I've worked on other books and I've always, not always, but for a really long time, I was very head down, like just want to write really good recipes. I want to get the books done. I want to stay on schedule, love my list, love a spreadsheet, <laughs> like <laughs> sign me up, um, meet the deadline, all that. And yes, that's still a big part of my personality. But I think the thing that has been just most gratifying about my work and the thing I just didn't anticipate was just the deep connection I would have with people who cook out of my books. And, you know, whether it's just the gratification of knowing I've help someone feel a little less scared of the kitchen mm -hmm. and that's huge but also just being you know like an openly gay woman and speaking a lot about my wife and my books has connected me so much with so many different members of the queer community with people's parents <laughs> with people's kids like um that means a lot to me I mean I have loved cookbooks my whole life I'm sitting in front of some of the cookbooks I own this is a fraction there are mm -hmm. many throughout our home and I grew up around them and I felt so connected to them. And they made me feel like as a young kid, like, oh, there's this big wide world out there and food lets you feel like it's very tangible. But I often wonder like, what would it have felt like to be a little kid, to be a teenager and to read a cookbook that had, you know, written by a woman with like kind of all these love letters to her wife <laughs> throughout it. Like, what would that have felt like? I don't know, but right. I'm really happy to, to, do that and I'm yeah. really grateful I can bring my full self to my work so yeah it strikes yeah. me that the book functions on a number of different levels and that there is the service of just all of these really approachable delicious recipes that are nourishing and comforting and someone could just open the book and easily make whatever's on the page mm -hmm. and probably be really happy with that and then there's the other level the sort of um sort of underlying like service of the book, which is these personal essays that you write. And, and I wanna talk about some of those um, that I think, as you said, could give a, a lot of perspective and um, an encouragement to any number of people who are feeling anxious, who are having, or you know, feel kind of in the throes of diet culture, which is like something that we'll get into, um, that I think is a really interesting aspect of this book. Someone who is, you know, is has never seen someone in the food world who is openly gay and talks about their wife, you know, all of these things. So um, I think like what you said, like it comes through that this is not about ego, uh, you know, this is about sharing something and being vulnerable because that is a way of sort of building community and reaching mm -hmm. people. So yeah. I love that part of the book and, and I love mm -hmm. that you got to write something so personal. Yeah. Um, so Thank you. yeah, one, one, just as sort of like a question about the idea of like reaching people and, and providing the service is like, is there a recipe? Have you had something on repeat in your kitchen, whether it's from the book or not, that you think maybe like people who are kind of weary of cooking at home, that it might, it might offer a little inspiration or something. Cause like, it's been, we were just talking like chatting in like the virtual green room. Yeah, the, the Zoom green room. <laughs> <laughs> the Zoom green room about like, wow, we've been in quarantine for a year, mm -hmm. basically. Um, like any anything you can offer weary. Yeah. Um, I feel like I lately have been a broken record about the following thing, but it's just the truth. So I'm just going to share it and I love it. And I'm wondering if you might have a connection to this food too. Maybe you do. But so for me, one of my childhood favorite things was matzo brais, like fried matzo. Oh my God. Uh -huh. Was it something you grew up eating? I, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes, for sure. And I was just like extolling the virtues of it to someone who had never heard of it. So I please continue. Were you a sweet or savory household? So most people in my household did it with grape jelly, which seems uh -huh. to be somewhat common. Um, yeah. But I, but also like my dad and I would sprinkle salt and sugar uh -huh. Ooh. and eat yeah. like sweet salty so that's that's how I preferred it you were prepared to do what you do for a long time <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah I mean yeah for anyone who didn't grow up eating like Jewish comfort food um fried matzo matzo braai same thing mm -hmm. you take matzo crackers which are just plain crackers you kind of break them up you make them a bit soft with some warm water and some people soak some people put in a colander whatever and then you mix them with beaten eggs and you cook it like in butter or whatever fat. 
so you're kind of stretching out scrambled eggs. I think that like is a good way to think about it. And so when I was growing up, both my parents worked full time since like before I was born and my mom like never cooked. And the only thing she ever made was sometimes breakfast on the weekends. I have an older brother and fried matzah was like something we all loved and like could all get behind. And it's something I didn't eat for a number of years. Like before I met my wife, like I feel like I never like made it for myself, like at home. And then I don't know exactly when during our marriage, but at some point in the last few years, I was just like, I haven't had matzo brai in years. Like we got to have this. And Grace was like, what are you like making the crackers wet? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, but anyway, we now have it all the time and Grace makes it all the time. And in fact, she made some for me today for breakfast and I just love it and, you know, make it if you'd like, but I think it's just a reminder of these things that we grew up with that mean so much to us that maybe provided comfort or joy at some moment in our life. Like I feel like as adults and home cooks, I find a lot of satisfaction in returning to those foods and making them for myself now. And then to have my wife who didn't grow up with it and she's like making me my childhood comfort thing. And she also loves it. Like it's just, it's very sweet. And it's also, it's matzah, eggs, butter, salt, and or sugar. Like these are very affordable ingredients or ingredients that can keep for a long time. Mm -hmm. Like, I think part of the reason we've turned to it so many times, like we eat it probably a couple times a week is like, it's just so quick. It's so easy. And so whatever your matzo bride is, mm -hmm. like go for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those, like, there's nothing in the house kind mm -hmm. of built that you can yeah. make. Um, and that's also like, I realize it's like a hard sell for people that have never had it. Cause it's like, wait, you take like wet crackers and <laughs> cover them in egg and fry them. Like that doesn't sound good, but it is truly so delicious. Yeah. And I like what you said about being able to revisit these childhood mm -hmm. favorites as an adult, because I've, and I've also done that. And I feel like it gives me a sense of um, reassurance because it, I, I really am confirming that this thing that I thought that was really delicious as a kid really is delicious. And that's sort of I, like affirming. Yeah. So, um, it like kind of, it, I mean, to me, that is comfort food. It is mm -hmm. like, it is nostalgic and it's incredibly gratifying to realize that as an adult, you still yeah. like, you know? Yeah. Um, totally. So, yeah. I mean, so you talk about in the book, how maybe in the introduction or one of the essays that like, you don't really cook from recipes, which I think is very mm -hmm. common for people that are, that are cookbook authors or chefs or work in the food industry. Um, so I'm wondering if for the, and for this book, like if you had to have a little bit of a attitude shift to think that the kinds of really simple meals that you cook at home could be recipes that mm. go into a cookbook. I think yeah. And we're used to recipes and cookbooks. Like you and I probably are used to thinking that like, oh, this recipe has to be sort of aspirational or mm -hmm. it has to look a certain way, or, you know, it has to have this garnish or something. Like, did you have to sort of rethink a little bit your idea of what types of recipes, mm -hmm. you know, are quote unquote good enough or, yeah. or whatever to go in the book? Yeah. Like worthy of, of working. Yeah. Right. Including it's, that's such a good question because I think, um, it sort of brings up, I feel like, I don't know, I guess I have a few goals with this book. And one is to just totally acknowledge what home cooks do every single day, which is provide food. <laughs> like, that's a big deal. And I think that in our, you know, our media landscape, our media culture, you know, the media we consume, I think, which, you know, we've both been a part of in various ways you know I there's more stuff than ever to click on and to watch and to you know and I think we're all trying to get attention and I think at the end of the day the idea that I think a lot of us believe like oh is this worthy of a cookbook that kind of thing I think that comes from this sense of just I don't know just this a sense that just rubs me the wrong way of just like, like, oh, we have to one up each other. We have to impress each other. We have to push you out of the way so I can go over here, like that kind of thing. And I, I don't know, I think I participated in a lot of that, like for a long time. And it just, I'm very tired <laughs> of it. And I just basically, when I eat, like the last thing I want to feel is 
like when I'm cooking for someone, I don't want to try and like impress them or prove anything. Like, I just want you to feel taken care of by this food I'm giving you. And I want to feel the same. Like, I don't want to be wowed. <laughs> like, I just want chicken soup. But, like, I want chicken soup and matzo brai. And I think these things are worth celebrating and acknowledging and honoring. And, you know, I mentioned this in the introduction, but I just, like, I really believe in the marathon of home cooking and not the sprint. And I think there's totally room for both. I'm just, I'm not a sprinter. <laughs> like, I like a long walk. And... I'm in it for the long walk. You know, I cook at home every day and I did pre pandemic and I will for as long as I possibly can, because I love it. It makes me feel really good. It makes me feel really grounded, mm -hmm. um, deeply connected. And all those things make me feel healthy and comfortable <laughs> and comforted. And I just think that, yeah, that is worthy of putting in a cookbook. And, you know, the recipes are incredibly simple. I think I've always if I specialize in anything, I think it is in really simple recipes for home cooks. But I think the recipes in this book are just the easiest ever, but it, that's not to say they're not without like a lot of consideration. And, you know, every ingredient, every step has had so much thought put behind it. And I just feel like when we as cookbook authors, like, you know, give someone a recipe, we're asking for like double, triple investment. Like not only are you going to pick up this book, not only are you going to come listen to us talk about it. I mean, this is amazing. And I should say, like, I so appreciate whoever is listening. Um, but also like you might potentially go to the grocery store, buy ingredients. You might spend more time with our book. You might, you know, give this, make this for someone. And like, those are all investments. And I just, I don't take any of them for granted. And I just want you to have like the best return on your investment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like the sense of like, there's a contract, like, and like, a mm -hmm. like we are the, the reader, you know, taking the time and the, you know, going to the store, buying the ingredients. Mm -hmm. It's like, you guys are in this contract together and yeah. You, yeah. You're in by providing this, you know, this really delicious tested recipe that is going to turn out for them. And so, so I hear you. And I think like the earlier point about the kind of like insular word world of food media, like a lot of what I see feels like people speaking, like people in that world speaking to each other rather than speaking to the mm. audience and meeting them where they are, you know, and like the person at home doesn't care about like, you know, if you're, if this book is better than that book or whatever better means, mm -hmm. you know, or is, you know, like the, the kind of standards that I think like people in the industry can hold themselves to are not the same as the standards that home cooks hold. Yeah. To. So um, I love that. And I love that it kind of gives you like the confidence to put these extremely simple recipes out there. And I also think what you said about, you know, there's a lot of consideration in them is something that is easy to misunderstand because it's like, secretly the simplest recipes that sometimes are the hardest and a thousand percent yeah the most testing you know mm -hmm. there's like nothing to yeah. hide behind um yeah. so I I love that you like make a point of that because simple is not the same thing as like mindless or um you know or uh sort of like you know slapdash or anything yeah like that. totally so, um it's actually really hard to do yeah I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And like, I mean, for me, I like, I don't know, I feel like in savory recipes, I've always felt, you know, I've, I've been <laughs> an avid consumer of many cookbooks. I think there is this automatic thing of like, where there's salt, there's also pepper. And mm -hmm. I love black pepper. I think it is like a phenomenal spice and an amazing flavor. And so if I'm using it, like, I really want to use it. And I really want you to taste it. And I don't automatically put it in every savory recipe. And also that comes down to other things I'm thinking about, such as like when someone looks at a list of ingredients, like if there's, if it just feels long, like that can be so off-putting, like there are so many opportunities for someone to close your book. <laughs> like, and I just like want you to keep it open. So, you know, if having that extra line, like this might sound so like granular, but it's like, it's very important to me. And it's like, will the black pepper make this better? If so, like, let's put a ton in and like have you taste it and it's going to be so good. But if it's just there because like everyone always puts it there, like I don't want to waste an extra line of text that might, you know, make someone flip the page. <laughs> like, like these are the things that are on my mind a lot, which is, yeah, why I just write so many things down. You can see some, of, I didn't realize how much right. you can see. Yeah, a lot of notes. <laughs> I mean, to that point, it's like, 
people like recipes are when they go out of your hands. And like you said, it was funny to like see me hold up the book. And I had the same experience when my book came out. It's like, oh my God, it's out in the world. Like yeah. that's so weird. It's this thing that you've been working on and holding so close to you. And then it, and then all of a sudden it's out there. And at that point, the recipes sort of become like living organisms and people might dog ear them and write on the page. Mm-hmm. Like people can add their own black pepper, you know, if that's totally, what they yeah. do. So like, I, I hear you, you know, it's like, you are giving them the kind of core of it yeah. and they're going to change it anyway. So yeah. you know, I think that that's, that sort of like as pared down as it can be is a great place. Like that's the starting point for, for people that I think is, is most useful. Totally. Um, so and that to me is the goal. Like, <laughs> I, I just, like, I just appreciate what you just said. Cause that is my goal. Like for you to make it yours, like I will share so much of myself in service of hoping that you do the same on your end, like mm-hmm. so that you take this recipe and like, you no longer remember it's Julia's black pepper special, <laughs> like whatever it is, like you make it yours. And right. that is like amazing. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Totally. Sorry, please go on. No, yeah. no, no. <laughs> um, well, I just kind of wanted to get into some of the essays in the book that you Yeah, wrote. please. I think that like for people that are used to cooking from cookbooks, it's, it would be easy to read this or to use this book and cook from it and miss the part where it's kind of like subtly polemical <laughs> and um, and how how this is a book that has healthy in the subtitle, mm-hmm. but like actually really pushes back against so much of what we see in the kind of like wellness cookbook space, which is yeah. about a diet or a food plan, which are ideas sort of based in restriction. And this book is is it's like very declaratively opposite of that Mm -hmm. um and so like I'm just wondering if like how much of the idea of this book was that sort of like I'm gonna write a polemic I'm gonna write something that is about embracing food and flavors and is you know I'm gonna put healthy in the subtitle but it's sort of not gonna be what people think of as a quote-unquote like you know health healthy cookbook yeah um thank you for bringing this up this is like incredibly important to me and just more important every single day. And so um, I guess the backstory to this is that, you know, for as long as I have loved to cook, which has been my whole life, I've always been in the kitchen since I was a little kid. Um, Many of these cookbooks are older than me. (laughs) Like I've had them forever. And as long as I've had this really positive relationship to cooking and this draw to it and a curiosity about it and like an openness to it, I have felt pretty much the opposite of all those things when it comes to eating. And I have felt very fraught about my relationship of consuming this food that I so love to prepare. And that is for a number of reasons, like a few off the top of my head are like just diet culture. (laughs) Like it's like all around us, it's in everything. I also grew up specifically in a home that really prized diet culture. And uh, my parents actually both worked in the magazine business. So you know, I feel like we hear a lot about, um, you know, especially young women and stuff. It's like you're comparing yourself to the people in the pictures of magazines and stuff. My parents' jobs were to create those pages, <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. so it was very much in the home I grew up in. Um, I mean, I was like bullied as a kid for my weight and size and stuff. So, and those things, you know, leave marks. <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, yeah, and then I just totally like doubled down on it. And was such a participant in diet culture for so long. And if anyone's hearing this, and I feel like most people maybe know, but I don't know, I just, in the spirit of like, everyone is very welcome here. Like if the words diet culture, you're like, I think I know what you're talking about, but not really just, I feel like what I am saying when I say that is like basically a culture that just prioritizes thinness over anything else. And in doing so encourages us to constantly try and get to some point that is both probably really bad for your body and your health and also just for your spirit and well-being and you're just miserable all the time or at least I was and it also tends to pit us against ourselves like comparing ourselves to like what I used to weigh or what I'm going to weigh in the future Mm -hmm. or pits us against each other like how does my body compare to yours you know it's incredibly ableist um and it's just really lonely making at least it was for me and there's just a lot of tension there and it's hard and it's sad. And I don't know, I had this really positive thing going with food at the same time of holding all this. And I was like in and out of Weight Watchers for like over a decade and counting points and stuff. 
And meanwhile, I'm writing cookbooks about the ease and joy of home cooking and, um, but not the ease and joy of eating. <laughs> and I think I was just getting to a place in my life where I was starting to just see this. Like I, to me, it feels like I turned the light on in the room and now I can't ever turn it off. Like I can't unsee what I've seen. That's the best way I know to describe it. And that's come with like a lot of therapy, a lot of like incredibly meaningful conversations with my wife who's been through her own journey and has shared that with me very generously. Um, changing my conversations with my friends and family, putting boundaries in those conversations, changing who I talk to and changing very much what I um, consume media wise, like books and podcasts and stuff. And I actually shared some of these on Instagram today, just if anyone's listening and is like, wait, which books, which podcasts? So like, they're all there. Like I listed them and people are adding more, which is awesome. And I feel like it's, for me, it's been very much like, oh, I really want to learn this new language. So I want to immerse myself in it, like change who I follow on social media, like all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. So all of that context, that's a lot of context, but I brought that all, I think, to bear in this book because I wanted to write a book about healthy cooking and eating that wasn't about weight loss because I haven't seen that. And it feels important for me just to see for myself. And I want to share that with as many people as I can because I just feel like it's really important and I think it's really valuable. And everything you said, you described it perfectly and much more succinctly than I'm doing right now. But yeah, this is a book about healthy food that is not about restriction or deprivation. And it's a book that is very much comes with the encouragement of like just feeling connected to yourself, to the people around you, to the food you're cooking, to the experience of cooking it, and to just like pleasure and fun. Like a lot of the recipes are really fun. Like when I talk about this, I'm like, I get serious because this is really serious. Like this is deeply like internal serious work, but it also can be fun. Like I've like met amazing people, <laughs> like in these conversations, mm -hmm. I, I enjoy my food more and I just want healthy to not be a word that makes us feel shitty about ourselves yeah. yeah 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 I mean I think that so often when I hear people talk about healthy the word healthy is that the way that people use it and that I have certainly used it in the past means healthy means like low calorie or yeah. skinny these, yeah right right and and I love that your that you are sort of creating this like extremely expansive definition of healthy and that healthy for you means like, do you feel good eating it? You know, it's, does your, does your, is it good to think? Is it good to eat? You know, mm -hmm. is it, and I love that your definition includes the idea of respect. And it, to me, it's about like respecting yourself, respecting others, respecting where your food comes from. And like that, I think that's like a pretty revolutionary not to like overstate it, but I don't think that I am, that that's really an, such an important yeah. shift in looking at like, what is, what is healthy. And I, I always think about the idea, cause I feel like I've had a similar sort of like, um, consciousness about diet culture and like, yeah. what you said, like you can't unsee it. Like once you see the contours of that mm -hmm. in society, it's, it's so obvious and you sort of can't believe that you never saw it before, but yeah. I feel like I grew up, I have sort of had a similar um, you know, context that, that you mm -hmm. shared. And so not um, so bright. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Exactly. The kind of like, you know, media messaging that as a teenage girl, you absorb without even yeah. really knowing it. I, I just think being able to, to challenge that definition is, is so important. And um, you also mentioned like you had sort of a light bulb moment where you, in the book, you mentioned like the matrix, you watched the matrix and it was like taking I don't remember if it was the blue or the red pill, whatever, whichever one it was. I know, I can never remember which is yeah, which. And I'm like, but one it's really them. important. <laughs> <laughs> right. Whichever pill, like what, is, was that a, like, do you remember that moment? And do you know, like, what sparked that? Yeah. Was, oh, yeah. Because it was like pretty recently. Like, I think I'm the last person to ever see the Matrix. <laughs> um, so I mentioned um, how supportive my wife has been for me in all of this. And, and this, I will just say that this is like, I am not an expert here. I am not an authority. I am just willing to be incredibly honest. And mm -hmm. there are so many people I've like learned from, again, the books and podcasts are all there. Like there's amazing people who have been challenging these ideas for so long. And I feel very indebted to, um, one of those people is my wife who <laughs> like saw the light bulb before, way before I did. And just basically very 
kindly and gently said to me enough times that I started to believe her that like there could be a version of my life where I didn't hate my body Mm -hmm. and she was like it's diet culture it's diet culture and I was like what what does that mean that's like why I like stopped to define it because I'm like I know what it feels like to hear this and be like I kind of know what you're talking about and Grace was like you got to watch the matrix like diet culture is the matrix and I was like I think I get what you're saying and she was like we have to watch it so this was like a year or two ago like this is like in recent history and so we watched it if anyone else hasn't seen it it's basically like you think you know what the world is but like you don't (laughs) (laughs) and so now I just because these are hard things to wrap our heads around or at least it's been hard for me because when it's all you know like it oh I mean this might sound too much I don't know but like it it almost feels for me like shifting a religion or something like I was raised in this religion and now I'm changing my beliefs and my mm-hmm. my faith system and the matrix really helped me to understand that so it's hard <laughs> to wrap your head around but now I'm like oh it's just the matrix right I got it. Yeah, totally. yeah. right right <laughs> I mean I so I wonder like I had a similar like awareness and Mm -hmm. awakening about this too and also to understand how diet culture and patriarchy are related and oh and capitalism and right right and they're all (laughs) in bed with each other yeah (laughs) right and like so I don't know and it for me like having and and I have done like I I wonder if like Christy Harrison is one of the Mm -hmm. podcasts that you include about like food psych like super interesting and and have like, you know, try to do a lot of work in this space. And so I feel like it might be selection bias on my part because Mm -hmm. I'm looking for it. But I just Mm -hmm. wonder if you also sort of notice, like, is there a shift toward, there's, you know, diet culture is so pervasive and powerful. And as you point out in the book, like it's a huge business, you know, it's, and so it's, um, there's a lot of money to be made in selling you diets. Mm -hmm. And I remember something from the podcast that was like, uh, from the Christy Harrison podcast called Food Psych, um, diets are the only things that fail 95% of the time, but when they fail, they're our fault. You know, it's only yeah, products exactly. that like, yeah, sold yeah. to us, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Do you think that there is a shift happening where people are understanding that, um, you know, living life with less restriction and free of these, um, you know, di- diets and is is this, I don't know, is this happening? Is it not? Yeah. Is it I'm looking for it. I mean, I... I feel in a, obviously like a very similar place as you. So I feel that there is a shift happening, but again, I am, you know, the way we all curate our social media feeds and our bookshelves and all these things, like we can choose the shift, right? So mm-hmm. I'm choosing the shift <laughs> and mm-hmm. I'm actively seeking out other people who already have or who are doing it too. So, but I do think, I appreciate that you brought this up that, you know, diet culture is completely tied to like patriarchy and misogyny and white supremacy and it's like like fat phobia is completely based in racism and there's an amazing book that's on my desk right there the um fearing the black body by dr sabrina strings that explains all of this and i'm saying all this to say that i think there's a shift around all of these things as there needs to be as is completely overdue and i think all of these things are, you know, I described it in the book as to me, all of these things we're talking about diet culture and stuff feels like this big knot to me that I'm just like trying to untie. And I think diet culture is very much in a knot. I don't know what I'm doing here, (laughs) but in a knot with all of these other major things that I think we as a society, as a country, as a world are reckoning with. And we should have a long time ago, but you know, we are here now. And I think when we start to pay attention to one of those things, you know, the light bulb shines light on all of it. So yeah. for me, it actually makes those things feel changeable in a way mm-hmm. that feels, I don't know, gives me some hopefulness. Like yeah. I know how differently I feel about my body today, sitting here right now, 8, 11 PM on Wednesday with you. Like, I know how differently I feel than I felt at a different point. Like, mm-hmm. and if that's possible, I didn't think that was possible. Yeah, And I'm not so naive to say like, therefore racism will be over. Like, but I just, it makes me hopeful that we, we can shift these things. And yeah, yeah, I think a shift is happening. I hope it is. I want to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. One, one metaphor that I um, heard about sort of like in, for people who are taking the steps into intuitive eating and trying Mm -hmm. to be less judgmental about their bodies and at, you know, strive for, if not self-love then body neutrality and all these things is like, it feels like for people that 
where food is is a real sort of like object of obsession and and um in an unhealthy way that like you know your life feels like this mm -hmm. and you know the journey toward intuitive eating can feel like holding it in yeah. open palm and, yeah. and the book sort of emanates this this sense of ease and joy that comes from the journey that you've been on. And I yeah. love that that's something that the recipes in like their small, you know, in small ways are is kind of communicating. Yeah. And that it's about this idea of living a healthy life that is not about um restriction, as we've said. So um it's like we're talking about these deep subjects and it's a book of 110 like super <laughs> accessible recipes, but but they are connected, you know. So yeah. um all right, so I want to get to some audience questions. So I just want to remind people to put your questions in the Q and A function. I have there's like a lot of other things that I wanted to get to that we didn't, um, but I'm gonna skip ahead to like I have like a little lightning round. It's not actually like high pressure at all. Don't don't get anxious. It's not nothing. No wrong answers. Um, but I'm gonna do this just because I think it's kind of fun, and then like I'll I'm gonna take some of the okay. audience. Okay. I I am just gonna pause really quickly and just say, I so appreciate all the other questions you came up with, even though I don't know what they are. Oh. <laughs> and I hope we continue to talk, you know, after this, but I just want to say, I'm, I'm glad we took the time to talk about what we talked about, because it is so important. And I appreciate your openness with it. And I love the open palm so much. And <laughs> I just think, yes, I think this, you know, if we're talking about a healthy cookbook, like this is the conversation. And yeah. All the recipes are there to keep you company as you go through all of these thoughts you know if you want to um but i just i'm glad we took the time to do that and now i'm ready for your lightning round okay good and i just want to say like i think i love that you mentioned that you put resources on your instagram today so it's like if anyone wants to learn more about these yeah. concepts like there's lots of books written about this and yeah. i say check it Amazing out books. Okay. yeah all right so this is going to be light and fun okay okay so just like 10 questions I don't even really know how I came up with these. I don't know if they're any good. Um, okay, favorite vegetable. That's so hard. Um, it's supposed uh, to be hard. I love broccoli. I love it. Hmm, such a good answer. I love it. So versatile. And, and people hate it, and I love it. I feel like broccoli is like, now I'm not doing a good job of my own lightning round, but I feel like broccoli is like, it's broccoli is like the default green vegetable, mm -hmm. you know? But that, I think, for that reason, sometimes it's maligned, but it really is such an amazing vegetable. Mm -hmm. So it's, you can do so much with it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for supporting my <laughs> yeah. I just think it's a good answer. Like people should give broccoli a second look. Okay. Um, fruit dessert or chocolate dessert? Fruit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Definitely. Desert island kitchen tool. Um, uh... I guess a water filter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. What would you take? Oh, like not necessarily. Not, not you had to cook on a desert island. Sorry, that was not clear. Like you're like just like you're like can't live without. I took that very literally. <laughs> um, I think I would have a very hard time living without sheet pans. I use them all the time. Mm, okay. I feel like I don't know. Maybe that's totally. not right, no. Cool. Yeah. I agree. Okay. A beloved or cherished cookbook that you have in your collection. If there's one that just feels extra special. Oh, so many. Um, oh, it's on my other shelf. The one I was thinking of, but I'll show you another one. I'll show you. Um, this is a copy I've had for so many years of, oh, it's so bright. And then Lewis's mm -hmm. taste of country cooking. I think this is just one of the most important books on my shelf for many other people's. And um, if you don't know about Edna Lewis, please, after you've been so kind to listen to us, please Google her and enjoy learning about her. And um, just one of the most important people I think in American history. And I love this book so much. I'm writing that one down. Um, okay, favorite acid in the kitchen? Oh, uh, lemon. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is your diner egg order? Oh, mm, I love this question. Um, I also like love diners. Like I know my wife is listening downstairs, like in the other room, like trying to keep our dogs quiet. And I'm sure she's just so thrilled to know how happy I am that you <laughs> asked me this because I like daily, I'm like, I just miss going to the diner. Mm -hmm. Um, I really love, I love a scramble. I love a feta and spinach omelet with extra crispy hash browns. Mm -hmm. That's like a go-to for me. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, okay, this kind of segues into the last question, which again, I'm cutting because I need to move on to audience questions. First meal you are looking forward to enjoying in a restaurant whenever like the new normal happens. Mm. Ooh, good question. Um, well, I've had takeout from them, but there is a restaurant in Kingston, New York, not very far from where I live um, called Top Taste run by this very sweet, wonderful couple, Sammy and Melinda. And it is just some of the best Jamaican food I've had mm. ever. And they're so wonderful. And um, it's really nice to pick up their food and bring it home, but it's nice to sit. There's like two tables in it. It's like, but it's nice to sit at one of them and talk to them while you're eating. And I, I look forward to doing that because I miss doing that. Well, yeah, nice restaurants. Okay, so I'm gonna switch to audience questions. Yeah. So the first, first one is from Betsy Wolfson. And she writes, I love the fact that you and Grace do so much volunteer work for your local community. How can I get involved in my area to help these people, this person mm. in Western Mass? Um, wonderful question. Um, so the way I found Angel Food East, where we volunteer, which is also in Kingston, New York, it's like a small um, version of uh, Meals on Wheels, basically. The way we found ourselves in that kitchen was I Googled our zip code and the word volunteer. And I just found out about different organizations. I called around, I like spent a shift here or there, you know, a few different things until we found a place we really like loved and it was a good fit. Um, so I encourage doing that. And I think also if you are particularly interested in getting involved with food and your community, now more than ever, I mean, so many children in this country go through the day without enough food and call your local public school system, the, food department and just ask them what's going on, what they're doing. So many schools are feeding kids and they'll know what's going on in your zip code. And they can, you know, if they can use your help, great. Or that maybe they can put you in touch with someone who can. Okay. Uh, Matthew Blyke, right? <clears throat> um, Julia, thank you for making this event so accessible. I love how approachable your recipes are. Your recipes are one of the few where what I make looks like the pictures in the book, <laughs> and, which I understand. <laughs> Do you spend a lot of time reworking your recipes to make them approachable or in my case, idiot proof? What does that process look like? Um, I, I mean, I basically, I don't, I spend a lot of time working on my recipes, but I don't spend a lot of time making them simpler than my idea of what they are or something like that's not a process I go through because I come at them from a very simple place, mostly informed by the fact that I cook at home every day and as much as I love food, love all these cookbooks, love talking about food, like I often do not feel like cooking. And I know if I feel that way, I can only like imagine for other people. So I come to it from that place, which is I think the place most people are coming to the books from. And so I, I don't know. I also just really don't love doing dishes. Like I'll do them, I do them all the time, but I just don't love it. So I'm just always trying to think about like, how can I make this thing really delicious and not spend more than 10 minutes yeah. cleaning up the kitchen. I feel like the kitchen is one is a rare place where laziness is such an asset. <laughs> I'm I I feel the same way. Like sometimes I don't want to cook, and sometimes I'm so lazy. And it's like this meal is going to be a one pot meal because I don't. And it's not supposed to be, but it's going to be because I don't want to do dishes. You yeah. Know? So. <laughs> and also, like I don't know, I just push against the word lazy there because I that's a word I use to describe myself often. And Grace is always like. <laughs> think about what you're saying because you're still making dinner that's amazing you're taking care of yourself that's wonderful right. right although sometimes it feels like I don't it's like I have to you know it's sometimes it's like the only option but I'm like well I'm going to do it as like streamlined and fast as I can so but yes I, I think, right I mean I, like, like, right lazy I support I'm, that like, right thank you like lazy I have like all the other work everyone does constantly you know so I hear you um okay this is an, an, a question from an anonymous viewer Ooh. Outside of cookbooks, is there another type of book, foodie or not, that you'd like to write? Is there a topic in food history or food studies that you'd love to tackle? Um, I, not in food history. Sorry, I'm not that <laughs> person. But I am. I want to write a lesbian romance novel because <laughs> I read so many of them and I love them. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I, you know, the whole like Shakespeare wrote King Lear and like now you should all feel bad about yourselves because you're not Shakespeare. Like that moment that happened, I like planned out this whole novel and I started writing it but I haven't touched it in like a year so I look forward to getting back to that I think it's such an interesting point that like because a friend of mine turned not turned me on to sort of like the modern day renaissance of romance novels mm -hmm. that would be like a great addition to the genre 
Can I give you a fun fact about this? Since I didn't expect we would be on this topic. One of like the most popular as she should be romance novelist of our time, contemporary romance novelist is the wonderful writer, Jasmine Guillory. I don't know if you know her books, mm -hmm. but they're so fun and so great. And in her last book, the um, one of the characters uh, was a active volunteer in her community and like worked in this community kitchen thing and Jasmine um, like saw the things I was posting about Angel Food East and reach out to me and interviewed me about it. And it was, it's been the highlight of my career. Oh my God. <laughs> so I just okay. connected some questions. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. That is the, the best anecdote. That's what I'm taking away from this conversation. Um, <laughs> okay, so Lindsay Gaziano writes, Julia always asks her podcast guests what their favorite childhood food is. So Julia, what is yours? Um, uh, so sweet of you to ask that. Um, it's my favorite question to ask and the hardest to answer. I mean, not surprise, the first thing on my mind, we spoke about it, but so many other things, um, including honestly, a lot of the recipes in Simply Julia, a lot of this book is me just, I think, trying to recreate the, the best moments of my childhood. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, okay, so I like this question a lot. Uh, oh, from, also from Matthew, okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier about all the media that people can learn about cooking, videos, TV, books, et cetera. For you, what do you get out of a cookbook that you don't get from a YouTube video? Mm. Um, I am happy to answer this, but I would actually love to know what you think of this because this is like a department you have so much more experience in. <laughs> I mostly go to YouTube to watch woodworking videos because I find them to be fascinating. I'm like a very amateur woodworker and I just, I watch them the way I think probably a lot of people watch cooking videos. like super interested in this kind of inexperience mostly want to watch it don't really actually want to do it maybe i want to do it i don't know mm -hmm. um but i think that when you go to a cookbook always but especially these days like you're having the experience of being not on a screen which i think is really important and valuable and also just the experience of you know you can trust this thing you know where it's leading to like i feel like i get on youtube and it's like three hours later I emerge and I'm like what happened and with the cookbook too I think there is the thing I tried to establish and build between myself and anyone here listening anyone reading my book or cooking from it is just trust and to me mm -hmm. that's the most valuable thing and I want you to feel that you can trust my recipes you can trust them being honest in my stories and I just think that's really valuable and I think you can find that in a lot of books and that's something that I think is sometimes hard to find on the internet I mean it's there I mean you've done it like it's there but it, it can be hard to find so right right yeah. yeah I feel like there's um like social media for in good ways and bad ways or positive and negative ways like there's a collapsing of of sort of like that happens through social media where mm -hmm. it's like sort of can't tell and, and it can be good and bad it's very democratic but it's sort of like every it's a totally even playing field and mm -hmm delving into a cookbook, you have such a greater sense of like the um, sort of like authorial, just, you know, like voice and authority and experience in a way that like is not, you know, that like social media doesn't really mm -hmm. make room for. But, um, but like YouTube is, I mean, video is such a great like medium for, for teaching and yeah. like watch, sometimes like if I'm having a hard time with a recipe, I'll watch like 15 videos mm -hmm. about you know, making, baking something. So I yeah. can, I can see. Um, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, very different, but um, okay. So here's a question that I really like. Um, Julia, could you please talk about your thinking around the sequence of recipes in the book? Is it like mm. an album where the sequence of the songs matters? I love this question. I don't know if I've ever been asked this. Um, I think, I mean, I don't, I'm not a musician. I don't know what that process is, but that is definitely how I think about it. And I think it's hard to answer how I make decisions about the order of recipes because I think it is it is a little bit like when you're driving and it's like so how much do you turn the steering wheel like it's kind of hard to describe like you just kind of know um but also there are some practical things that influence it like the design of the book like or you know 
I don't want to put a bunch of recipes in a row that don't have photographs and you're just going text, 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 because all of a sudden, like, I feel like I at least like my eyes like blur over that part. Like I want the cadence and the pause of a photograph and I want those evenly dispersed. So that might change things because something like there's a meatloaf recipe in the cookbook, a French onion meatloaf. It's so good. You like caramelize onions and yes, they take a long time and you don't have to stand there the whole time. It's fine. But you can't rush that. Like that's just what they are. Yeah. Um, I just feel like no one is honest about that. <laughs> um, and you mix those into the, I use turkey, you can use whatever you want and some Gruyere cheese, delicious, like the crouton put in the oven. It is so delicious and it is so ugly. It is like, <laughs> it is it is not attractive, but it is so good. It is like, I love it so much. It reminds me of my aunt Debbie, who was like one of my favorite people. I don't need a photograph for that recipe. Like no one needs to see it. <laughs> like just close your eyes and eat it. It's one. <laughs> um, so that recipe, like I'll think about where I'm putting that based on other photos I'm going to include. But yeah, I think a lot about, I, I think I think of like the simplest to the hardest and by hardest, nothing in the book is hard, but it's in mm -hmm. my opinion, but it's like something that might have three steps instead of two or you know four mm -hmm. steps like that kind of thing so I think in that order but yeah just kind of like a sort of a natural cadence and a good kind of mix of stories and stuff so yeah very hard question to answer but like there is thought there yeah right okay so this question is from Lori Kaufman and she writes a practical question I'm a single person who has just started cooking for myself and want to get better at it the bulk of recipes are designed for four to six people and I feel like it's not always just as simple as cutting all the ingredients by a half or a third any totally. tips yeah such a wonderful question and it's something I've thought about a lot because I think you know we we're talking about things before like the patriarchy and stuff just to bring up that like light topic and I think that's something that is reinforced by serving sizes and cookbooks like I think there's this assumption of like a two-parent household with two kids and like the recipe serves a family of four and this is what like a family means and like that's not what my family looks like we are two wives and two dogs <laughs> like um so I don't know that's a thought I have I just want to put that out there but I will Oh, this is, I like need to do these all right here because I have all my favorite <laughs> books. Um, I am just going to say, please get this book. This is Cooking Solo by Clancy Miller, who's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, this book came out a few years ago. This is a book, the subtitle is The Joy of Cooking for Yourself. And Clancy has done all the math for you. She has mm -hmm. like made recipes that are perfect for cooking for one person. And Clan Clancy's a friend of mine. And something I learn every time I talk to Clancy is just like, um, what it looks like to prioritize like joy in your life like it is not a surprise to me that that is yeah the joy of cooking for yourself and so yes I think the recipes in my book you can scale down you can make the whole thing and freeze individual portions I do that a lot because I don't love to cook everything from scratch all the time <laughs> um, but also buy this book and she can just tell you it's great it's really yeah, wonderful that's, that is a great book I have that one too yeah um all right, so here's one. Putting it back in its place. I'm listening. <laughs> this is from Tracy Edwards. What advice would you give to a 13 year old looking to pursue an occupation in the culinary industry? When it's probably a question you get a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think just, I don't know. I was a 13 year old who was really interested in food. And so all the like adults in my life were like, are you gonna apply to culinary school? Like, are you gonna have a restaurant one day? Like, I don't know where this like kind of accent and pointing <laughs> is coming from. Um, it was supportive, but I think it was like this very linear thinking of like, oh, food, professional chef, restaurant. And, you know, I mentioned earlier, my parents worked in publishing, so I had exposure to different creative careers. And I'm very grateful for that because, I mean, restaurants are important and amazing. And I, you know, we were talking earlier, like, it's just so hard to be in the restaurant industry right now. Um, but yeah, it's not an industry I was ever interested in working in. So I think I, I would be curious what else that 13 year old is interested in. And so where that kind of curiosity or passion for food might align with other things. And just, there's so many jobs, like there's the food industry, I think of as like a big umbrella with so many industries underneath it. Like, right. so there's a lot of different, th like people are prop stylists for a living. Like they pick out all the objects that are in the photographs of food. <laughs> like that's an occupation. So, right. yeah. Um, okay, so it's 8.31. I think just, oh I know goodness. we're a little bit over, but maybe time for one more question. Is yeah. That, 
Is that totally. okay? All right. Yeah. This will be the, I'm sorry, I'm going to get to all the audience questions. So this will be the last one. Um, oh my God, there's actually even more. Okay. Oh uh, Thank so you for, I'm just listening and I'm very present and I am just seeing like there are a lot and I just want to thank everyone for questions. And I am constantly chatting with people in my like DMs and stuff. So if I didn't answer your question, you can ask me later or tomorrow or whatever. Yeah. Perfect. And I feel less bad about not getting to all of these. Um, this is from Darden Ukash who writes, hi, Julia. I'm so excited to cook some recipes from the book. I also work at Angel Food East and it's really fun making so oh much food for a lot of people. Are there any recipes in your book that scale up easily? Oh my gosh. Um, hi. <laughs> um, there are so many recipes that scale very easily and I'm happy to connect with you <laughs> later. And I, you know, I can tell you what will fit in the pots we have. Um, so many of the recipes, especially like all the soups and stews, very, there's a whole chapter of them, very easy to scale. There's a whole chapter of vegan one pot meals. So you can just make a bigger pot <laughs> or two pots. And um, yeah, like a chapter of all chicken recipes, like very easy to, all the recipes are also like very forgiving. Um, so I feel like, like the question earlier about cooking for one person and scaling things down, I think same thing in the other direction, like scaling things up mm -hmm. can be a little tricky. Um, but yeah, a lot of the recipes really lend themselves to that. But yeah, thanks for being here. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. I don't want to go over too much longer. Um, sounds like we're just going to have to continue. You and I will have to continue. And then you and possibly many of the listeners will have to continue. I mean, the, the that's, conversation. <laughs> that's the goal. And I just, my whole life has been just a conversation about home cooking. And I'm just <laughs> excited to do it with, with you and with everyone here. And I, these have been really good questions. So thank oh, you, everyone. Yeah. And my thank pleasure. you, Claire. Yeah. Thank you for like, mm -hmm. you know, inviting me to chat with you about the book, which is wonderful. And I want to say congratulations again. I know it just, it just published, um, came out yesterday. So I hope that you have like a very fun and fulfilling virtual book tour. Um, and I'm honored to be one of the first, you know, like participants in it. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And thanks to the Harvard bookstore. Thank you so much, Claire. It really means a lot to me. Thank you. And thank you both for an amazing conversation, wide ranging, fascinating. I ordered the book mid, mid event because I was like, this sounds so good. Um, so thank you for everything. It was really wonderful. And thank you for kind words about the bookstore. Um, everyone out there, uh, thank you for joining us tonight for this wonderful conversation. And um, you can visit us online at harvard.com. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a wonderful night. Keep reading. Be well. Wear a mask. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night.